as a trilogy that would have been watched in a single day, as we were talking about with Eurystia, as a trilogy. So there is a second play called Prometheus Unbound, okay? And, and, and even a third play, okay, that Aeschylus wrote. Unfortunately, we just don't know what those plays were. We know a little bit about them, but not a lot. So this is, it's important because, for example, if you were going to talk about justice and the Oresteia, but you only had the Agamemnon, think about that. You didn't have, now that you've studied with me, you know what I'm saying. If you didn't have, for example, the Libation Bearers, where Orestes will begin that process of justice and then finally in the Furies, the Eumenides, Athena will appropriate justice and the jury system of the courts and all of that. If you didn't have those last two plays, and, you, and you, all you had was the Agamemnon, and you wanted to talk about Aeschylus' view of justice, you'd be flying kind of blind. I think the same is true in our study of the Prometheus um, uh, bound text. But having said that, this is all we have of this play, and the play becomes canonized very soon in Western thought. And to the end, then, to be Promethean means that you are defiant to the last. Well, let's talk at level 2A really quickly, messages, themes. Well, one obvious for Greek audiences, don't, don't jack with Zeus, right? Don't, don't mess with the gods. Versus the other view, that God is a tyrant and therefore soon God will be dead. Whoa! The tension there is we'll talk about the conflict here in a bit. Or how about this one? The fighting spirit, the Promethean spirit, versus this is insanity, Hermes says. Are you kidding me? It's crazy to go against the will of the gods or to go speak against Zeus, right? But then there's this other interesting message, and Prometheus says it here. Fate is even greater than Zeus, which raises the whole question of freedom versus determinism. One of the central questions, of course, that the Greeks gave to us through these texts is, how free are you, right? How free are you? And of course, as we've asked many times, about the free choices that you got to make in the first year of your life. None. Didn't choose the people who looked up to, to produce you. Didn't choose anything that happened in the first year of your life. At what point did you ever choose the language that you first learned to think and speak in? That was appropriated for you. Well then when in your life were you able to begin to even think about freedom and free choice and free will, as we talked about, of course, in our lectures on Milton's Paradise Lost. That's such an important part of how Milton's theodicy project works out. To what degree are we free? To what degree are we fated? It's an interesting question. Of course, the theodicy question we've, we've raised before, and here it is again. Why is stuff happening to me is the wrong question to ask, Aeschylus might suggest. We have to learn to ask, why is this happening for me? Why? Because suffering is a propedeutic. Suffering teaches us something, right? Suffering is inevitably going to happen. The question is, what can we learn from it? That's at least one rendering of this. The other will say, suffering happens and there's nothing you can do about it. And at the end of the play, it gets jacked anyway. What difference does it make, right? One of the beautiful things about this play is that it doesn't resolve until you begin to ask the questions and then you have to make your own decisions about how you read Prometheus as hero or as villain, right? At level 2B, well, the rhetoric is genius. I mean, some have said that of all the plays that you can read of the Greek theater, that without question, Prometheus Bound is the most challenging. Why? Well, I think at the rhetoric level at 2B, there's some, there's some good reasons here. Notice the symbolism of Prometheus. Prometheus as what? Fighter? Rebel? Iconoclast? The one that goes behind the back of Zeus and defies Zeus? And then once he's kind of punished for it, he says to Zeus, up yours, I don't care, I'll, I did it, I would do it again. It's like he's screaming the F word right in God's face. Whoa. Of course, another symbol is that eagle. The eagle, of course, will be representative of, of Zeus himself that will constantly challenge, right, the, uh, the, the, um, the convictions of Prometheus by eating at his liver. The liver grows back every, every night, and then again, once again, the eagle comes, right? In other words, Zeus is the one who is constantly kind of picking at Prometheus to say, you shouldn't have done what you did. Symbolism, of course, here could be as well that notion of the guilt 
that maybe Prometheus someday might feel. Clearly, he doesn't feel it in this play. Which leads us to a second uh, rhetorical observation, the conflict, right? We said that Aeschylus is brilliant as cre at creating these conflicts. Well, of course, this is right. <laughs> we could say it. Um, Zeus versus Prometheus, the conflict there, right? Pride versus obedience. There it is, right? Think about Io as well as being a powerful example of what it means to get jacked by Zeus and Hera. And she didn't do anything at all. In other words, there doesn't seem to be any logic in this at all. You'll remember that Socrates will ask in those dialogues of Plato, is this really the God we want to believe in, a God like Zeus that's anthropomorphic, behaving like uh, you know, a lot of men that Socrates says that we know, and none of those men do we give that level of reverence to, who are always running around hanky-panking and then trying to cover it up uh, for, their, for their wife, Hera. Um, we, we shouldn't reverence or worship a god like this at all. Mm. Finally, notice the narrative approach. Even though this is a, let's just say it out loud, it's a static play, it's boring. I mean, if you just put right these characters on stage, this is kind of a boring play in terms of action. You got Prometheus there. He's not going anywhere. He's having these dialogues with people. And yet, the language and the tension of the play is majestic because, of course, it resurrects all kinds of dynamic questions. Even though it is a static play, it's a dynamic play. Well, let's talk at 3A and how we're going to relate to this in and, uh, and, and other texts. I've already mentioned Shelley's Prometheus Unbound. I hope that you will find that one. Of course, Frankenstein, I've given a whole lecture on the, the reasons why Frankenstein's Mary Shelley call it at 18. She wrote this novel? Amazing. At 18, your age. She wrote the novel and called it Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. And again, people who haven't read the novel assume that Fra Frankenstein is the monster in the novel. No, no, no. Frankenstein is the doctor who wants to somehow overcome death through the technology of resurrecting dead matter, dead, dead life, bringing it back to life. She called that novel the modern Prometheus. And of course, when the monster, remember, uh, is abandoned by the creator, the monster learns to read by reading what? Right, Milton's Paradise Lost. Notice how all of this is kind of connected in some way, right? Well, I mentioned Milton. Of course, we have to mention Milton, Satan, and, um, and, and Paradise Lost, right? What is it that he says? Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. He says, Satan's, um, Milton, Satan, he says that God created Adam and Eve for God so that they could fawn and worship him. Satan says, I'll never do anything like that. That sounds very Promethean, right? Of course, think about Shakespeare. Shakespeare's Iago, very Promethean, and in fact, at the end of the play, very unusual, as we've said in that lecture, at the end of the play, he doesn't ask for any kind of forgiveness. He is defiant, Promethean, to the end. Think about Henry V. Think about how Promethean Henry is. He will stand up. He will not do what people expect of him. And yet, in that play, the English people, while they loathe Iago, they will give tremendous reference to the Promethean elements of Henry V. In other words, there's two sides to this Promethean uh, blade, if you will, right? Well, um, there's a way of thinking about this within the literature that I want to share with you, and I've shared it in other lectures. There's a school of uh, 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 philosophy that tries to talk about Western thought as moving between two different kinds of polar ends. On the one hand, we talk about the school, or the way of thinking, out of Jerusalem. And then the school out of Athens. Now, a way to kind of define the Renaissance is the rediscovery, after a thousand years of the quote-unquote Dark Ages, it was named the Dark Ages, of course, during the Renaissance, dark not because they didn't have fluorescent lighting, dark because of the way that they thought and processed the world, but for that thousand years of the Dark Ages, this, this uh, view says, the prominent story was the story of Job. The multimillionaire who loses everything because God has this conversation with el Hasatan, this, this satanic-like figure, who is then going to tempt Job by doing all kinds of terrible things to him. First of all, taking away his wealth, 
then taking away his family, and then finally taking away his health, so that you have this wretched picture of Job, right, sitting on an ash heap. He's got these, like, huge pussy sores, and he's cutting them open and begging dogs to lick on those sores. I mean, it's the worst imaginable picture of suffering. Job's wife says to him, you should just curse God and die. Job is a believer in God. And Job says, no, I have, I have faith, I have trust. I'm going to ask why, and I'm going to ask for an answer, and the answer that comes to Job out of the whirlwind is, of course, the answer that says, I'm God, I do whatever I want. Where were you when I created the world? Job will continue to believe, and at the end, what have some have called the Hollywood ending of the book of Job, he gets all of, all of his stuff back, he gets new children, and, uh, and, and, and he's happy. That story, the story is sometimes called the patience of Job, right? But it's probably better to call it the believing of Job, right? The obedience of Job, we might say. That's the school out of Jerusalem. Of course, it makes sense that that's a Christian story, right? A, a Jewish story that becomes a Christian story that's celebrated, right? Well, the school out of Athens, and this is the school that is rediscovered in the Renaissance, is the story of Prometheus. The Prometheus, who, who says to God, oh, yours. No, no, no. I will defy you to the end because you're wrong. You are absolutely wrong. Whoa. To be Promethean then, you can see where this tension now lies. There are many who argue that Western civilization is predicated on leaving the school of Athens, or school of Jerusalem, and moving towards the school of Athens. Of course, the rise of technologies. Um, I've mentioned Ken Wilber before, American philosopher, his book, Marriage of Sense and Soul. He talks about modernity in this way. The good news, the bad news. That there's two sides, if you will, to all of these technological advances. Think of it this way. That smartphone that you have in your pocket or in your bag that you're not supposed to look at during our lecture, right? Okay. Well, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it's incredibly good. What, are you kidding me? Give me a reason where it would be bad. Texting while you drive and you, uh, and you end up dying because of it. Well, yeah, but that's not, the, that's not the fault of the technology. That's the fault of me, the idiot, driving while I'm trying to text. Nonetheless... Is the technology good or is it bad? Well, you can kind of see that this is a very Promethean-like question in regards to giving a fire and the other gifts that Prometheus gives, right? Finally, um, at 3A, what, what is your favorite, now I can say this and you'll appreciate it, what is your favorite Promethean text? Um, what is the text that says, I don't care what anybody else says, this is the direction that I'm going? Um, Many years ago, the band Rage Against the Machine was a classic example of a Promethean band. Many have commented on the fact that in the history of music, especially in America, uh, and, and not just in America, but we think even about the Beatles and the, the way they were quite Promethean in their approach to music, right? Um, that music in our culture has often carried with it the currents of a very Promethean or a don't tell me what to do mentality. Of course, finally, uh, we said this already in, in the early part of the lecture, now come back to it. In early lectures, and, I've, and these are obviously posted on LearnStrong.net as well, when I, when, when I have to introduce American thought, I often will do it using that mantra, don't tell me what to do. It's fundamental to what it means in American thought, to being an American, that it's very Promethean, don't tell me what to do. Think about Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, I've given lectures on this for the Harvard Classics already, right? Think about what he says in Self-Reliance. He who would be a man must be a nonconformist. Don't tell me what to do, right? Of course, think about Henry David Thoreau. The mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately. Hmm. He could have said I went to the woods because I wished to live Promethean. Finally, at 3B. I, again, this is how we always finish, because I want to challenge you. Where do you come down on this, right? What is your view of Prometheus? Are you yourself Promethean? Do you have friends that you would qualify as Promethean? Can you think about a time that you kind of stood up to authority, that is to say you were Promethean, because you knew you were right, right? And you fought. How did that work out for you? Uh, can you think about a time when you didn't? stand up because of fear. The very fear that Prometheus says is what keeps people um, from not standing up to Zeus. The fear that kept you from fighting. And what does this play kind of say about that letting 
the, the fear rule your life or rule the way in which you respond to authority or authority figures of any number of kinds. Well, there you go. We, we, in, our, in our next series of lectures, we're going to turn now from Aeschylus to Sophocles, who many argue is even more important as a writer, if you can imagine this, than Aeschylus is. And when we get to Sophocles' Antigone, we're going to see a powerful woman who will stand up to Creon and say, I know that you said I can't bury the, bo the dead body of my brother, but I'm going to do it anyway, even if it means the fact that I know you're going to kill me. I don't care because you, King Creon, king of, of thieves, you are wrong, and I am right. Whoa, what more Promethean moment on stage can we see than that? Well, I hope that you will continue to hang with us as we turn, before we get to Antigone, to her daddy, oh yeah, Oedipus, and we'll talk about that classic play. Thank you.